My name is Laurel Falcone and I'm the Manager of Corporate Engagement and DEI Programs at Access Employment. I'm joined by my colleague Hillary Turner, who is our um, Customer Service Training Program Manager. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about retaining employees through cultural sensitivity and inclusion. Before we get to that, I just want to remind everyone that the session is being recorded. So if you're not comfortable being on camera or speaking, please do not do so. Uh, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit Union, the Anishinaabek, the Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the Haudenosaunee, and Huron Wandat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. Just a reminder as well, uh, we, uh, the recording will be on the inclusion uh, forum website, which I will put in the chat later on. Uh, and today we're gonna talk to you about the importance of retention and inclusion and take you through some cultural sensitivity training. I'm proud and happy to be one of the 14 professional development events happening across the country today uh, with the Workplace Inclusion Forum. First, we wanna get on the same page. Uh, so we've heard the terms uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, especially uh, as of late, a lot of organizations are placing an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, we understand the terms before we get started. Today, we're going to focus a lot more on inclusion, uh, but diversity is the mix of people in your organization. So uh, it's the unique traits that the individuals possess, um, and it's addressed through diversity and inclusion strategy. Uh, today, we're going to focus on inclusion, which is more about the environment uh, that creates um, a sense of belonging so that the uh, mix of people that you have in your organization are able to work together. Uh, and this is addressed through organization wide behavior. Uh, so inclusion is important. Uh, retention is important. And without inclusion, you won't have retention. Uh, so in, um, regardless of any situation, when your employees come to work, uh, they want to do their best. And in order for them to do their best, we have to create an environment where they feel like they can excel and where they are um, set up for success. Uh, so this is obviously in, not despite of, but because of their unique strengths. Uh, so looking at the graph here, um, when employees feel like they belong, they report greater creative potential, lower turnover intentions, and higher engagement in their work. If we look at the intent to stay at the organization, 72% uh, of employees who perceived that they felt the sense of belonging uh, or that they were welcomed in their organization uh, were more likely to have intentions to stay at the organization. And with this, they're obviously more highly engaged and obviously reach their creative potential more than those who don't feel like they belong. And of course, when our employees intend to stay at the organization, um, this is good for turnover rates because turnover rates are very costly to our organizations as we know. Uh, so when employees uh, feel like they belong, they feel welcomed at their organization, uh, they're, going to, they're going to care and they're going to stay. Uh, so as you can see, creating a, a sense of inclusion leads to greater retention and greater retention leads to positive company culture, increased productivity, reduced hiring costs, fewer transitions and employment gaps, better customer experience and uh, a higher brand reputation. There was actually a uh, Better Up research study uh, recently, I believe it was 2020, um, and I'm gonna put the link in the chat to one of their case studies, uh, but it was found that employees um, in Canadian workplaces, employees who felt a sense of belonging actually promoted their organizations 167% more of the time than those who didn't. So I wanna kind of open it up to the floor at this point. Um, before we get to challenges. And if you've been working, if this is your area and you've been working on retention 
or you've heard of these things or anything, what else is has been a benefit of keeping a, a positive, inclusive environment at your workplace? You can type it in the chat. You can also unmute. Anybody? Did I cover everything on my slide? Good. Perfect. Well, if you think of anything, please don't hesitate to, to throw that in the chat. Okay. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, all the, the above mentioned uh, aspects would be smooth and we would have no problem creating this inclusive environment. We'd have no problem with employees wanting to stay at our organizations. But in reality, this is not the case. Uh, some of the challenges uh, that um, I'm gonna focus on today is uh, communication, accountability, and trust in leadership. Uh, I read an interesting article uh, by Accenture. Uh, they wrote it last year. Um, it noted that while 68% of leaders feel they create empowering environments in which employees can be themselves, raise concern and be innovative, only 36% of employees agreed. So that's only about half of employees agreeing with organizations. And if they are not perceiving all of the things that and the efforts that you're make that you're making and that you're doing at your organization, uh, the your retention rates are, are not going to go anywhere and your inclusive environment will be at a standstill. So clear communication um, of policies and strategies that you're working on is critical in, in ensuring the perception of fairness matches what you're actually doing towards an equitable uh, environment and, and equitable strategies within your organization. It also really needs to be clear to employees that not only is your hiring processes equitable, but that everything in the workplace uh, is also inclusive, is also equitable, especially for those equity seeking groups so that they're able to not only come into your organization, but also excel, thrive and mobilize within the organization. Accountability sort of goes hand in hand with communication. Uh, just making sure that uh, I think over the past year or so, uh, we've seen a lot of organizations step up uh, in terms of, of creating uh, inclusivity uh, and diversity within their organization. But it's just making sure that you're not only talking about doing these things, the blanket statements um, on websites or the equity statements on job descriptions, but instead you're actually putting into practice uh, some of the things that you're talking about. Uh, so this could be, um, you know, having a DEI person to, to be sort of the advocate of everything that you're doing, um, making sure you're keeping track of everything that's being done and making sure you're communicating that to the organization. I think I've said this to a couple of of organizations lately, but it's important not only to talk about the, the successes that you've had with um, you know, low turnover rates or creating an inclusive environment, but also the challenges and the steps towards that as well. Um, it's important to note those. So uh, perhaps along the way they can add their input, they can be a part of that process. Um, and then lastly, the trust in leadership. So by now, I think, or I hope many of you know that uh, without leadership buy-in, and maybe some of you are those leaders, without leadership buy-in uh, and the support of the initiatives that you're doing in your organization, whatever those initiatives may be, I don't know your organizations uh, individually, but whatever those uh, initiatives may be, your leadership needs to be on board. Uh, and uh, whether this requires you know, a sit-down conversation, a business case, um, they have to be in support and they have to be showing their support through the organization, perhaps a company wide email, um, hosting one of, of, a, of a chat or a session or a mentoring session, something to show that they're involved and that they're, um, they're on board with whatever initiatives are taking place. Um, it's also important, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later too, uh, to have what, uh, what we call inclusive leadership. Uh, so this is a leadership that not only supports uh, your organization's initiatives, but also represents the diversity in your organization as well. So I'm going to I'm throwing it over to you guys now. 
uh, just to understand what are the, some of the challenges, I listed a few, uh, but those are definitely not all. And whatever is happening currently in your organization, I would love to hear about it. So if you want to let me know some of the challenges that you're facing in trying to retain good talent, um, I'm opening the floor. So you can write it in the chat. You can also unmute. Up to you. Any other challenges? I definitely didn't get everybody's challenges. I think someone's un someone unmuted. Anyone? Okay. Job jumping early on. Andrea says job jumping early on. Yep. Wages, labor shortage, skill shortage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talent pool, labor shortage, COVID. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Miriam made a good point and said, one challenge I find is that, is that sometimes big organizations have a lack of representation in the organization. So it is hard for employees to feel welcomed and that they belong. Good point. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, and it's something I refer to as inclusive leadership, not only supporting the initiatives, but also re having representation on the leadership, leadership committee. Um, very, very important to drive your initiatives to create a workplace of inclusion and belonging and to keep retention rates high. Uh, I see here family not wanting to stay, employee happy family not, yep. I think it's also important to note we're not going to sort of alleviate all of the, the challenges in trying to retain good talent, but it's important to maybe hone in or focus on a few. Um, and then once you've mastered those areas that have been causing sort of the, the turnover rates, then you can move to uh, the next group. So instead of trying to take on all the challenges at once, it's better to focus on one or two. Awesome. Thank you for all of your suggestions and thoughts. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, this past year, Access actually uh, received funding uh, for a project called Diversity in Canadian Workplaces. And the focus of this project was uh, to look at the racialized individual's experience through the employment process. Uh, so this includes recruitment, the retention portion of it, which we're talking about today, and then the, mobi mo the mobility part of it as well, uh, moving up in the organization. These are some of the findings that we, that came about. And this was through speaking to 50 different organizations and surveying over a hundred of our uh, alumni uh, who are now working in Canadian organizations. And these are some of the areas of focus that came about. Uh, but certainly, again, these are not all of them, just some that we're going to focus on today. So number one, and um, I've kind of alluded to this already previously, but a conscious effort really needs to be made to ensure that there's alignment between uh, recruitment, not only recruitment practices, so bringing that diverse talent into the organization, but also ensuring that employees feel supported long after they're brought in. So number one is this culture and work environment. Uh, two portions or, or components of this is our ERG groups or BRG groups or affinity groups. These are employee resource groups uh, for short uh, and open conversations. So building and collaborating with uh, ERGs is a really good idea for your organization. And you can start small if you don't have employee resource groups at the moment, you can start with a committee. So just some type of committee that is open to everyone and an opportunity to share for people with shared identity to come together and voice their ideas, connect, work together, 
um, create sometimes even some educational content for the organization, um, create sort of a purpose, a goal, some things you want to achieve at the organization and within the environment, um, and just educating the organization on different topics related to your identity group. Um, as I went through my career in DNI so far, I remember that the first committee I ever started was eight people. It was an organization of over a thousand and uh, it was open to everyone. And we started with eight people. And from those eight people, uh, it has now moved into separate ERG groups. So, so starting small is, is a good step um, in, in pushing forward any strategy, especially with, with your ERG groups. And then the second, which came up a lot in our conversations with uh, different organizations, uh, large and small, is having this, um, this open conversation or forum where um, you can create time and space for dialogue. So conversation about any topics um, that might be you know, issues or problems people are, are experiencing, uh, or things that they want to see at the organization. Um, so a bit of an extension of the ERG groups, but uh, it can be one-on-one. -on -one. It can be in a group setting. Um, it just opens lines of communication, especially if you want to get your leadership involved in this. It opens lines of communication between leadership and other levels of the organization uh, to be able to voice their opinions, um, encourages employees, even new employees, to get involved and to not um, to be not be fearful of, of voicing their opinions or suggestions, especially in smaller organizations. Um, it could be touch points, regular touch points. Um, and eventually some of these open conversations in a lot of the organizations led to uh, a sort of mentorship program. So one-on-one -on -one conversations, either bi-weekly or weekly with someone from leadership and an employee or two employees. Sometimes it was, uh, people who identified as the same uh, race or in the same, or with the same religion. Other times it was sort of a mixing of, of two people who identified very, very differently. Uh, and uh, this really highlights um, the diversity of language and learning to communicate with across cultures. Uh, and uh, luckily for you guys today, we have a little bit of a, a snippet of our very own cultural sensitivity training. Uh, so that should give you a bit of insight into this diversity of language. The last one is uh, creating career pathways and growth opportunities for your employees. Uh, so creating an inclusive environment is obviously step the first step, uh, but making sure that um, leaders especially can sort of support um, support any growth opportunities that uh, their employees may have because a big big problem and challenge in retention is that oftentimes uh, employees don't feel like there's growth opportunities and they don't feel like they're growing at the organization and so they move on to where they might feel like they have an opportunity to 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 flex their muscles really and and use utilize their skills uh, and uh, in, very important to track any progress that you've made. Uh, so this kind of goes back to accountability, which I talked about in the first slide, but really tracking any progress in any of these three areas that you've made. If you've had you know, a committee meeting where certain things were talked about, let, let the organization know. Um, keep track, keep track in a spreadsheet, keep track in a dashboard, something where especially leadership can kind of see the progression of different initiatives at the organization. I was reading recently to uh, in McLean uh, that leaders, um, there's certain qualities or things that leaders can do uh, to ensure that uh, they are supportive of their, of their organization and are, um, are being leaders. And this was one, ensure that everyone is heard, uh, make it safe to propose novel ideas, give team members decision-making authority and share credit for success. Uh, so those are just some of the things that you can do. Um, and going back to leadership, um, it's important that um, 
we're creating an organization where, again, I'm writing this point home, where there is inclusive leadership. Leaders support employees. They represent those employees. Um, for example, uh, there was a, there's this something called a Black North, North Initiative here, where it requires leaders, organizations require leaders to take a pledge uh, and not only to uh, show their cultural competency, to uh, show their supportive initiatives, but also to make an effort to show visibility in leadership. Okay, so uh, I know I've talked about a lot of things. There's been a lot of a lot of things I've covered, but just to sort of sum up and um, look towards maybe things that you could start to do in your organization or enhance if you've already started. Again, I don't know where you are in your organization, but um, it's important to identify individuals in the company to champion and support open conversations, whether this is an employee resource group or whether it's one person or a group of people. Um, it's important to, to demonstrate not only externally to other organizations, but internally that you're making an effort to uh, hear employees, to make changes, uh, and these changes are slow. They don't happen overnight, but it just shows that you're making an effort. Strategize opportunities for career mapping with all employees as part of the retention process. Uh, so some employees are a little more ambitious and they will come to you and say, these are my career goals. This is the path I'd like to take. Others are not as open. So as a leader, it's important to um, create that safe space to talk about their career, their career growth within the organization and bring it up if they, um, if they won't. Uh, so just because someone doesn't bring it up, it's important to know that uh, it's not that they might not be thinking about it. They just may not feel comfortable to talk about it. Uh, creating a forum where people can share their ideas and experiences and confront uncomfortable topics without judgment. Uh, so this goes back to uh, open conversations, uh, which are oftentimes many of the organizations, some of the big five banks noted that they were often uncomfortable, but it's really in those uncomfortable conversations that the learning happens and that uh, the growth in the organization can occur. And then lastly, invest in training and programs for everyone. Uh, it's important um, to go beyond understanding that we all have unconscious bias. I know probably lots of people have heard about unconscious bias training, but to work towards training that focuses on more of the conscious efforts um, and activities that will facilitate the shift in workplace culture to help racialize individuals to succeed, to help the organization to succeed, really. Um, and uh, today we're gonna start with what we uh, provided access to many of our employers called uh, cultural sensitivity training. And I'm going to, to send that over to my colleague, Hillary, to, to take you through that. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you. Nice to be here. And thanks, Laurel. That was really interesting. Um, so yes, I'm going to pick up where Laurel left off, talking a bit about cultural sensitivity. Um, the goal here is that you learn, hopefully, at least one new thing that you walk away with. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear from you later. Some of your thoughts, again, you can speak aloud and mute yourself. You can go into the chat. Uh, both are great. So does anybody want to share what they're hoping to learn? Um, you registered for this workshop. I assume that there's an interest um, in this topic. Does anyone have any goals for, for today's session? Um, so we're going to start then by looking at cultural stress and cultural stress, as it sounds, um, is about stress that happens when you have people from different cultures interacting. So it's obvious that it's experienced by newcomers, but what might be a little less obvious is that it's also um, experienced by the dominant culture. So Laurel referred to those uncomfortable moments that are that are moments and opportunities for learning. Um, that's that's a great example of this. So, like all stress or like all things, really, moderate levels can be good. Um, they can lead to personal growth, brain stimulation, innovation, social inclusion. 
Um, so cultural stress is something that our first instinct might lead us to believe is negative, but in fact, uh, there, are, there are definitely positive things that can grow out of it. So cultural sensitivity, um, as it sounds, it's about being sensitive to different cultures. So creating those safe spaces, um, talking to people honestly, exploring your own um, perhaps unconscious biases. So it's important to be mindful, empathetic, flexible, and curious. Curiosity is always important. So what could cultural sensitivity look like? Well, it could be as simple as inspiring someone by modeling and explaining Canadian workplace values. It could be asking someone their preferred pronouns and actively using them. And it's also using layman's terms, avoiding explaining jargon. Um, if you've ever trained in a, in a language that's not your first, you understand the challenges around it. And perhaps um, if you remember your early days in your organization, when people were using acronyms, and I know for me, I was constantly scribbling them down and then later on going to my supervisor and asking, what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, so it's a lot easier if you don't make the assumptions that everybody's on the same page. So it's important to open your mind, learn about differences and adapt to diversity. So there are uh, continuums when we talk about cultural dimensions. One continuum uh, that's looked at is this idea of the individual versus the group oriented. Um, and then there's another type of continuum where on one end you have hierarchy and the other you have a more egalitarian structure. So we're gonna look at these in a bit more detail. Does anyone have any questions so far? Need any clarification? Okay. So I don't know if you've heard of Geert Hofstede. He, uh, he's a well-known Dutch social psychologist who studied organizational culture, especially um, looking at cross-cultural perspectives within that. So there are lots of different areas he looked at. We've just taken one sample here to give you a brief glimpse into it. Um, you can see that on this bar graph, Canada is represented in blue, China in purple, and the United States in green. And what it does is it looks at different concepts different, um, and how the different cultures view them. So is there anything that stands out to anybody? Oh, I'm sorry, I received a message. The sound is cutting out. Okay, let me take off my headphones, see if this helps. Please let me know if this is better. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. And thanks for letting me know, I appreciate it. Um, so regarding this, this chart, um, does anybody have anything any comments or any observations? Anything that jumps out at them? I know for me, uh, the power distance, so that comfort with someone who's your superior, um, I find it very interesting that China is double what you see for North Americans with that, with that comfort level. And then obviously, when you look at the next one, individualism, um, you're gonna see that China is at about a quarter of its North American cousins. So this comfort, these ideas of um, the role of the individual and the role of the group and comfort with um, supervision or authority, these factor into the workplace, right? If you think about relationships you have with your team, um, the people above you, the people um, that you work with, then yes, you can imagine how certain assumptions you might make when you communicate with people from other cultures might not actually be assumptions that they're making on the other side, because of course this is all based on culture. Um, when, we, when we communicate with somebody, what we're doing is we are expressing our ideas based on our own understanding. And then we send out that message and they receive that message, but they interpret it using their own cultural lens, of course. And then they, you, they respond in kind. So there's a lot of potential here for miscommunication um, because exactly as someone has written here, as Mariam's written, the cultural norms are different. Um, if you look at long-term orientation, so that's 
thinking about the future, right? Look at China there, literally coming off the charts compared to us. Um, and indulgence, meaning self-indulgence. Uh, once again, it's interesting to see where the Canadians and the Americans align with each other, where we are a little bit different. Um, for example, in that individualism category, look how strong um, the Americans are, um, even above, above us, 80 to 91. And then how that compares with, with cultures from other parts of the world like China. Any thoughts? Questions, has anyone had any experiences? Um, where these um, maybe perhaps there's been a miscommunication or there's been a surprise in your understanding uh, about a situation based on different perspectives um, because of the cultures of the people involved. Maybe if you were born somewhere else or if you have worked somewhere else or um, if you worked on a team with someone from somewhere else. So there's a lot of there's a lot of times when when these interactions have potential for miscommunication. So just having, creating awareness around this um, is, is the helpful. Okay, so let's go, sorry, my computer keeps um, freezing on me trying to <laughs> change my slide. You can hear me pressing my buttons. Um, so just please bear with me. Okay, here we go. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> you gotta love virtual presentations. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts you'd like to share about Canada versus, versus other countries? I see that Ryan wrote, I find the correlation between uncertainty, avoidance in China and long-term orientation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for noticing that. It is, it is interesting. It's very interesting. Can everyone still see the screen? Please let me know. Yes, thank you very much. Super appreciate it. Okay, it's just Laurel giving me a heart attack. <laughs> so, um, Let's look at individualistic versus group oriented. So individualistic, what do we mean by that? A worker who's individualistic focuses on their personal needs and goals, values freedom, autonomy, has a sense of personal responsibility, a self promoter, may struggle with collaboration and may seem self-centered. So perhaps you've been involved in some sort of group work or on a team where somebody um, was a bit, you found a bit, challenging to work with, and perhaps that was because of where they fall on this continuum. Group oriented, of course. Oh my goodness, here we go again. Sorry, just bear with me, please. Hmm. Okay, well, group oriented, of course, is going to be um, the opposite. So it's going to be someone who feels more comfortable in a group, somebody who's more focused on um, community, someone who doesn't like to stand out. And if you can think about what that might look like in group work or on a team, um, it can be frustrating when you have people that are from the opposite ends of the continuum and they don't necessarily come to a project with the same um, perspective and the same goals. So somebody who's group oriented might see someone who's individualistic as bossy or as selfish. Um, and someone who's individualistic, working with someone who's group oriented might think that they're being lazy, um, they're lacking initiative, they're, they're not proactive, right? Um, so, there can definitely be miscommunications around this and having that awareness and the ability to have open conversations around it is important. So there's also a continuum of egalitarian versus hierarchical. So on the egalitarian side, as you would assume, um, uh, assumes roles are flexible, treats people similarly, subordinates feel empowered, 
this collegiality between levels. Um, someone who's egalitarian may dislike micromanaging and may also feel free to express opposition um, whenever they feel something's unfair uh, without perhaps a shared sense of boundaries around that and appropriateness. And someone who falls on the more hierarchical end prefers well delineated roles, treats people differently, defined structure feels secure to them. They appreciate clarity, purpose, um, followers seen as lacking initiative and leaders are seen as author authoritarian. So perhaps um, in addition to thinking about where other people fall on these continuums, perhaps you can also reflect upon where you fall and, and your inclinations and how these present themselves in the workplace. So of course, different people have different communication styles within a culture and obviously this grows um, even more so when you're talking about cross-cultural communication. So how do we communicate um, the volume of the voice? Some people you know, are very loud and some people are very quiet. Um, and it's a cultural concept of what constitutes quiet and what constitutes loud. My, my understanding of loud might be different than somebody else's. Personal space, whenever um, I hear personal space. I think of that Seinfeld, and I'm dating myself here, but I'm thinking of that Seinfeld episode, you know, where where they had uh, somebody was a what they called a quiet talker, and often what happens if you're speaking with a quiet talker is you start moving closer um, because you want to hear, but sometimes that other person feels that as an invasion of their of their private space, so they then back up. And then you move forward. Um, and the next thing you know, it's become a very uncomfortable situation. Um, another, another communication style is directness, right? Um, how direct are people in their messaging and how some cultures tend to go more in circles um, rather than directly saying yes or no. So I know um, at the university, I spent a year living in Japan teaching English and I really, I really learned a lot about the differences in, in, in the way we communicated, not just in about volume of voice, but definitely in directness. And for me, that, that, was, a, that was a challenge. Uh, it was a challenge. I'm not the most patient person. And when I ask a question, um, I like to get an answer and to expand upon that. And sometimes to get an answer was, was, um, was very difficult. Body language, of course, really important. Some people, talk with their hands, some people not so much, some people um, smile a lot, some people make direct eye contact in other cultures, that's considered rude. Any, any other um, suggestions of what communication styles can look like? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca says tone, absolutely. Tone is really important. And that's why there's so much potential for miscommunication in emails and especially in text, right? Because the tone is missing. And when the tone's missing, um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it certainly happened to me where someone's, you know, assumed I was being sarcastic when I was being sincere. Um, and that just didn't come across in the writing. So tone is really important. And that, that comes out when you have verbal communications. But it's something you have to be really aware of when you have nonverbal. Um, and the type, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, and Jerry, words, words are important too. The types of words we use. So our vocabulary and choosing um, the words that we choose. And what we need to remember is again, for us, you know, we may be speaking in our first language. Um, so we have the privilege of being able to voice what we wanna say um, exactly as we wanna phrase it. Whereas if you've ever had to work it in a language that's not your first language, there's a lot of challenges um, sometimes and in, in saying what you want to say and hopefully not implying something else or using the right level of sophistication um, in your vocabulary. I know for me, there were times that I would be asked a question in Japanese and I had a full answer in my head in English, but I didn't know how to say it in Japanese. So I had to give a much simpler answer um, or sometimes sort of not give my full um, um, my full thought or, or, or my fully true thought because I just didn't know how to say it. I didn't know how to express it. So having awareness around this, um, this use of vocabulary and also um, slang as, as Sahila mentioned. 
So this is um, a great part of vocabulary that we don't always think of, especially in the workplace. But if you think of more casual situations, perhaps like the, the water cooler, right, that you speak about, or when you're getting coffee, um, a lot of the time we just relax into our comfortable, more personal, um, less professional selves. And a lot of slang is tossed around and that's not always understood. So then therefore we sometimes judge people on their reaction, not realizing that they may not have understood what we, what we said. Thank you for that. So I'm gonna wrap this up with a summary. Um, cultural sensitivity is knowing that differences exist between cultures, but not assigning values to difference. So things aren't better or worse. They're not right or wrong. They're just different. Being mindful involves the readiness to shift one's frame of reference, the motivation to use new categories and understand differences and the preparedness to experiment with creative decision-making and problem solving. So finally, it's important to watch for signs of underlining uh, culture shock when you're working with people from other cultures. You might notice some moodiness, aggression, lack of humor, fatigue, self-isolation, um, substance use, things that are out of the ordinary. These might be indications that people are struggling. And uh, it's important to, to step up and help the person find support in their community. And of course, from access, we are certainly here to assist you as well. Okay. Does anybody have um, anything, any questions, any stories they'd like to share, any examples? Please feel free to unmute. It seems every time I look at the chat, that's when my, that's when my screen freezes. Okay. Well, I have thank a story you. to share. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I work for an organization in a small town. And on Friday, I was fired because of not fitting in with the rest of the group. Mm. Um, about uh, uh, individualism that you were talking about, I had asked too many questions to clarify. And based on that, and based of, on my color and my approach, uh, and the way I dealt with people, I started a peer support group, and that was all taken negatively, uh, stating that I disrupted the organization atmosphere, creating new ideas in other people's head uh, to come forward and uh, ask more questions, or I stirred up the pot in a nutshell to say, um, and a communication with other workers were great on my part, but my supervisor did not like that uh, others were becoming aware of their rights. So um, what, what does an immigrant do when it comes to uh, giving racist comments uh, and uh, assuming that your religion or your background or your knowledge, doesn't matter how long you live in Canada, people's concept have to change. So what is the difference between Canadian, uh, Canada and other countries is that we are a very multicultural oriented uh, society. And um, it takes many, many years to educate people in power uh, about different cultures. There are cultures within cultures and by the time you want to understand one culture from another, it takes your whole life. Uh, but um, the, the difference here is that what can a person of culture do when they are let go because of somebody else's shortfall? And not all immigrants are well versed in the law um, every little thing an immigrant has to go and run and hire a lawyer. So if you put yourself in an immigrant's shoes with cultural differences, do you have the financial support to go run and hire a lawyer to bring justice? So a lot of human rights issues are ignored. Uh, 
I hope I didn't talk too much. Uh, these were some of my experiences that I have seen within the Canadian culture, and it's a shell shock. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I, I had a similar situation happen to one of our clients recently as well, and she was let go because she asked too many questions and it made the team uncomfortable. And um, I think it's hard because you're right. It's there, you're, we're not always well-versed in the laws and uh, you don't, you, you know, you're not going to run out and go hire a lawyer. So I think that's why um, organizations need to do their part to ensure that, and this is, I'm going to bring this up again, ensure that the leadership team and people who are, have authority and, and have power in the organization are, understand what you've gone through. So they are, there is visibility, visible, you know, differences in, in leadership. There isn't just that those same people that have been running the organization for 20 years. When we spoke to alumni, they said, you know, it's really important to have people who can advocate for the for the struggles and the journey that that as a newcomer or as as a as um as a racialized individual, our experiences and and to to know how to communicate uh, with us and and that we're not everyone doesn't work the same and everyone doesn't talk the same. And uh, I think that's sort of one goal of the reason why we deliver the cultural sensitivity training to all the organizations that we work with, because we want them to know that, you know, just because someone says this or does this, it means this in different cultures. And I think that's really important to have that uh, cultural competency uh, to, to know that we don't just want to hire a diverse organization. We also want to be able to um, maintain that diverse organization and make them want to stay and make them belong. And that's really the challenge for organizations at this point is the retention piece. It's uh, not easy, but it's, it's more, there's a lot of avenues that organizations have now to hire from diverse organizations, to work with community partners, to uh, tap into diverse talent pools. And there is a lot of talent. I think the challenge for employers and what we need to help and support them on is the retention piece, is the cultural sensitivity, the cultural competency um, and things so that well beyond hiring, this doesn't happen. Uh, because I've actually sadly heard this a few times over the past few weeks. And I, you know, I'm sorry that that happened to you because it is, it's happening. And I think that just now more than ever makes us realize how important this is uh, for, for organizations, for individuals. Uh, so the fact that you're here today and all of you are here today uh, to learn about this is really one step uh, towards uh, trying to uh, make changes in the organization. Hillary, any comments? Um, no, thank you for sharing that. And I see a lot of comments in the chat uh, that are very supportive of you. Um, and really um, express empathy because that, that's a horrible situation to, mm -hmm. to be put into. And it's, it's you know, for some people, you know, call me naive. It's, I don't know when you say it's surprising, but it's really disappointing and hurtful. And I'm so sorry that you've had to experience that. And hopefully through trainings like this, people will have bigger understandings and not just pay lip service to mm -hmm. inclusion and diversity, but actually walk the talk. Mm -hmm. It's a strong, that makes a stronger workplace. It makes a stronger culture. It makes stronger people. It makes stronger companies, um, which just leads to better community, better country, um, and better outcomes for everybody. Anyone else questions, comments? But cultural sensitivity course. Uh, I have delivered many cultural sensitivity course, but uh, the organizations uh, only um, attains the services of a nonprofit organization by running one, one cultural sensitivity course within an hour or two, and they think they know it all. Uh, 
lip service, according to uh, Jerry, I agree. They give a lip service. They will call in a residential school survivor <clears throat> who will talk for an hour and uh, poof, after that, uh, the ideas and the knowledge they have gained is gone. They do not implement it mm -hmm. into their policy and procedure manual. Legally, they will do it, but practical, they will not do it. So for me, the sad part is, how do you not advocate for yourself and the injustice? And the organization claims that they are serving the community. How can you advocate for the voiceless, for the weak, for the person who has sought help? And if you are their voice and the leadership treats you in this manner, can you assume and think and imagine how they will treat their uh, community members who are seeking their help? Uh, so just one or two course does not make you culturally sensitive. You gotta live that life, you gotta experience it, and you have to be willing to learn, and vice versa. I have to also be willing to learn the Canadian culture. Doesn't matter if you come from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Newfoundland, every state, every province have a culture. So the willingness has to be on my part. It's a two-way street. It's a revolving door. But uh, just one workshop mm, will not resolve the issue. No, I absolutely 100% agree. I think I, I mentioned it to is some organizations and this is a huge problem right like a lot of organizations are saying that they're doing all these things but then when you hear these stories that we've heard today you really really question if they're actually doing anything about it uh, and it's it's a tough it's a tough line um, but they're the open conversation piece um, that many organizations are implementing is an ongoing um, conversation between uh, and it's not meant to be, you know, a, a, let's just use a white leader educating a racialized employee. It's actually meant for um, leadership and managers and other employees to be educated on uh, the racialized individual or the newcomer individual's experience in the organization, because that's where the learning and the growing will happen. The ongoing conversations, hitting those uncomfortable pieces um, because that's really when you're hit with the uncomfortable aspect of it, it, that's when you really sit there and think, oh my God, you know, because there's lots of people that don't know. We don't know. I don't know everything. Hillary doesn't know everything. You know, we don't know. So for someone to come to us, you know, and say, these are what's happening or, and have those conversations. I think that's a really positive step that a lot of organizations are doing now um, because they're realizing that like Accenture said, they're realizing they're doing all these things, but I don't think the perception and the actual, um, the result is what they want. So, which is why this, this conversation and open conversation or whatever you want to call it, uncomfortable conversation series is what some people have called it. Um, it really alludes to the, the misunderstandings, the miscommunications, the actual, really the, the education of, of people who who don't really know and don't really understand. And it's from there and those uncomfortable conversations that then maybe things can start to change at the organization. And you said it earlier, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's a long, long process. Um, but I think, and I hope that given all of the unfortunate and terribly awful events that have happened, it has really pushed organizations to want to do better, not just to be seen it that way, but to actually want to do better. And I, I hope, you know, we've had a lot of organizations come to us for support and ongoing support. Um, you know, we delivered this, this sensitivity training last week to KPMG, and they have asked for sort of weekly updated handouts on things that just to remind their mentors and their, their staff on on these things, knowing that if you do it one off, like you said, it's not really going to make that much of a difference. It just sort of ticks a box. And that's what we really want to avoid. Thank you.
Anyone else? Questions, comments? Hillary will, uh, my screen is frozen, so Hillary will put um, our emails in the chat if you want to reach out, if you have anything that you think about uh, or you have questions, concerns, comments, uh, you can email us. I also, I don't know if she did already, but have the website to um, the case study with uh, Better Up and uh, the inclusion chart, the inclusion charter website uh, that uh, you can go and look for all the recordings of the sessions today, as well as uh, a couple of upcoming events. I believe next week there's a networking session that actually um, allows you to chat and connect with workplace inclusion leaders from across the country who will talk a little bit about what they're doing, their experiences, and um, you'll have an opportunity to, to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, and this will be posted on the Inclusion Charter website as well, uh, providing the recording uh, was okay today. I know my screen froze sort of halfway through, uh, but I just wanna take the time to thank you all for being here and for contributing and for participating. Um, this is only one conversation, but I think there's many, many more conversations that obviously need to be had. And hopefully uh, we can have those together and, and, uh, and try uh, to do what we can and do our part to learn, grow, and, um, and collaborate on these very, very important issues.